The final speaker for this session is Professor Duncan Holden from Princeton, who will be talking about topological order versus symmet uh, local symmetry breaking. Okay, I'm going to. Um, I'm not sure how much I fit into the, uh, the, the conference on um, broken symmetry, or because well, I'll tell a little bit about what's uh, really a big new uh, paradigm in condensed matter to understanding that we can have transitions between states, not because their symmetry changes, but because their topology changes. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you a few cartoons about some of this thing. And actually, I'd maybe I should say I do strongly disagree with what Michael was uh, saying because, um, in fact, one of the most tremendous shocks uh, in, in condensed matter theory and probably many body theory was the discovery of the Laughlin state and the understanding of fractional quantum Hall effect and all absolutely qu all quantitative information has come from the remarkable, f on this thing is come from the remarkable fact that one can actually do numerical exact diagonalization calculations and actually see what's going on. And in <laughs> yeah, it's actually been remarkable because we, this is the first case in physics where Wick, we realize that Wick theorem is not the answer to everything. I and mean, we have thing with a brick, if you have Wick theorem based uh, physics, you hit a brick wall when you hit these new states of systems. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, <coughs> uh, yeah, so around, up till around 1980, the focus on in condensed matter theory and probably in particles too was on this whole issue of, of understanding the rich spectrum of different kinds of symmetries that can be broken and what the implications were. And as I say, the, um, what's, been, what's been happening since then is we've realized that, that we can have transitions where there is no uh, change in, in symmetry as such, but there is a change, an, a, 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 a qualitative change in the system, which turns out to be about uh, topological changes. So uh, as I say, I don't really have too much to say about uh, uh, Brout, Engl um, Englert, and, and Higgs mechanism. I, I guess I've been hearing this. Of course, I'm, it's way before my time, but I've been hearing this from our side of things as Anderson Higgs mechanism and little grumblings. But uh, basically, the whole issue about local, the, 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 the revolution to understand about local gauge theories has, has, has permeated into condensed matter. And in fact, when you liberate gauge theory discussions from the, 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 the tyranny of, of, of the Lorentz group, which is just one particular point symmetry group of, of, of space-time. In condensed matter, we have all these other, we have much richer class of possible vacua with all kinds of other different symmetries besides Lorentz symmetry. And in fact, the, of course, all these principles in gauge theory are quite independent of the details of the point group of the particular realization that they applied to. So it's a much more interesting thing. So, so all kinds of interesting uh, lattice-based gauge theories, which are not supposed to be approximations to space-time, but actually models for lattice-based systems are actually being studied very, uh, a lot by a lot now. <coughs> so let me just, I uh, don't want to waste too much time on this, because I want to talk about the quantum Hall effect. But I was going to say the simplest example, uh, toy models play an incredibly useful role in, in, in understanding things. and. The simplest example of a topologically ordered state seems to be this magnetic problem that I accidentally stumbled into into 1980 and somehow made my career after that because it turned out to be the first of the non-trivial topological states to be, the, to be explicitly found. And it's got various kind of things. This is a model of a spin chain, which used to be thought very academic things, but in fact, people spend find all kinds of amazingly interesting things about spin chains these days, and they're used as models for, uh, um, uh, you know, for, for equilibration, for broken, um, for many-body localization. All kinds of calculations are done because they have some other, all the simplest kind of non-trivial quantum systems you can make are often formulatable spin chains and can be treated by various numerical methods. And we learn a lot from understanding these things. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, so this is a model which has some field theory description uh, in terms of uh, an O3 nonlinear sigma model. And the interesting thing was that, in fact, for the case of spin a half, um, it, 
it's actually controlled by the existence of a topological theta term, which kind of causes a whole lot of uh, cancellation of vortex processes. <laughs> so in this kind of toy model, the symmetry uh, breaking term, D, uh, just gives rise to a trivial, massive, disordered, unentangled product state where every site is in this SZ equals zero uh, state of the spin along the z-axis. And uh, as I say, historically, in the absence of this term, it's an, uh, we should switch to get rid of that. It's an isotropic model. And uh, because of a kind of, in fact, this is a, the power of mathematics and the power of the misinterpretation of mathematics, people not understanding what the beta answer, beta, of course, himself didn't understand what his uh, solution meant, but uh, it was a remarkable solution which had a lot of deep mathematics of quantum groups floating around in it when it was eventually properly interpreted. It was kind of badly misinterpreted and sort of um, uh, superficially supported the kind of simple uh, interacting Goldstone mode picture that was suggested by the higher dimensional success of spin wave theory. So this system is an antiferromagnet where the spin direction is uh, in an ordered state would be arbitrary, but uh, it's staggered. Well, it's not exactly the same as a ferromagnet, but the quantum dynamics is different. Um, but essentially, the, the, norm, the notion of the typical magnetic states that people thought of naturally, um, probably starting from the semi-classical picture, were totally unentangled states. These are simple product states. And of course, it turns out that the uh, topological states are, are intimately and deeply associated with quantum entanglement, which is why they were kind of different from the kind of states people looked at before they even thought entanglement was not a philosophical issue about measurement theory, but was, um, but it actually, as of now, it's a, a very concrete issue. So, for example, if I take that toy model with a spin chain and make it e and, uh, and add even an extra term to it, this so-called biquadratic term, which is, uh, turns out to be a very useful thing to add. You see how rich the, the spectrum of these systems can be. There are various kinds of uh, critical regions and uh, scale invariant regions or broken symmetry regions. The case of interest was actually the, the, the two states here, one of which is the, the topological state, the other is the trivial state. And there is a continuous uh, second order transition between the two, which could be you know, mapped into a sine Gordon model, etc. <laughs> so uh, it's amazing how rich these, uh, these, these, these quantum spin systems are. And uh, you know, people had a lot of fun in tracing out these sort of phase diagrams. So as I say, the, the notion of the entangled state turned out to be as follows, that the, the kind of previous states one would expect for an antiferromagnet were all these things based on uh, the having long-range broken symmetry, so the spins are kind of pointing up or down or chosen some direction to align parallel or anti-parallel to against, but they have no, no, there's no real entanglement in this kind of state, and you can reassemble this by bringing these magnetized spins in for infinity and just putting them together in a product state. And the key thing that was happening was that, that the, the, the topological state ends up being uh, uh, an absolutely entangled state and a very beautiful, uh, very clean toy model for the state emerged later due to uh, one of my now colleagues, uh, Elliot Lieb and also Ian Affleck and Kennedy and Tasaki. And of course, when you have a very simple model, it's very easy to, it, it's very, uh, it reveals a lot of things about the state. And you can see that the remarkable thing about this, if you, you basically divide these, these spin one objects are refactorized into spin one half, they, and they, they join up on either side with their neighbors, and you get this typical topological thing of, of an edge state where there's one left behind at either end of the system. So this is the kind of picture that the entanglement between the things is, can be viewed as like a chain of people holding hands, and at the end of this long chain, they're like two independent one-handed kind of degrees of freedom, okay? And uh, so this was a, I mean, in retrospect, it's very simple, but at the time, since none of the states people thought about were really had any entanglement built in in a fundamental way, uh, it's a, the why these things were so different is because we hadn't, no one had thought about the, what entanglement could really do for one's quantum systems. And of course, 
It turns out that this uh, topological state, the one with the people joining hands together, um, is, uh, is now classified as a symmetry-protected topological state. So we can classify things, and there's a large now there's a large blending of notions of symmetry and topology and this notion of, of, of topological protection. And uh, in this particular case, the, the protective symmetries are 1D spatial inversion and time reversal. So it turns out that if I maintain those two symmetries, I cannot go continuously between the two states. And there's always going to be a transition between them. And in fact, one could have seen it because if you actually put this system, which has got no, no broken translational symmetry, so there's no reason not to use an odd-membered ring, you actually find with an odd-membered ring, the two states have different parity quantum numbers under inversion around the midpoint of a bond. Obviously, the one with the entanglement has a minus sign coming from the bond you invert or and the other one doesn't. And in fact, you find that this is a, a typical thing. So of course, what happens in this transition, as you approach this transition from one side or the other, the topological one has, if you have an open-ended system, you've got these non-trivial edge states. They, they delocalize, and they gradually smear out into the middle of the chain, and they disappear as the gap closes, and then the transition happens. Uh, there's some gapless state on the transition line, and then it's gone. Then it reop the gap opens on the other side without any uh, Thing. So this kind of turns out to be a, uh, a, a poster child for things happening not just in one or two dimensions, but higher dimensions. We now have a, a kind of very large classification of the possibilities using very, all sorts of index theorems to uh, uh, classify what kind of things can change continuously and, or, or can't, where there's an there's a obstruction to a, to, a, to a continuous path between different states. And in fact, this toy model played a huge role. It, it, it was a challenge to lots of people either who didn't like the ideas or did like the ideas to kind of prove or disprove them. And it led to people developing all kinds of techniques, a whole density matrix for normalization group scheme, the whole matrix product state scheme. All those things have their origin in actually people are trying to apply various things to the problem of this simple little toy model. So it's amazing how much production it generated throughout the community through different people looking at it and has been incredibly fruitful. So it's amazing. And in fact, the generalizations, one of the features generalized in many ways, lots of the typical things are there. And in fact, I'll say the Kitaev chain, which is a superconducting chain, uh, it's got interesting stuff to it, but one of the basic things about the Kitaev uh, superconducting chain is it's very similar to the AKLT model. You, you reorganize and repair up various bits, and you get left with now these half, these Majorana zero modes at the ends of chains, and these are the things which will carry so the entanglement of these objects are supposed to be carrying the topological, the, 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 uh, the information in the entanglement that should be used for a quantum computer. And in fact, Microsoft have gone down this route with some kind of put about a billion dollars into having people demonstrate braiding or give up. <laughs> with, they have to do it within three years. Uh, I suppose that's when the money runs out. OK, so what I want to talk about mainly uh, a little bit at so this meeting is uh, there's many people here seem to be interested in the, in the interface between quantum mechanics and gravity. Actually, I would like to make a point. I'm going to talk about the same kind of things that Bert was telling you, but I'm going to give you a much more kind of uh, sexy sort of underpinning to it. Uh, I'm going to say that the project, physics projected into a, into a single Landau level is a remarkable, it's a UV complete continuum model and it's a quantum geometry. So it's the closest thing that quantum that uh, condensed matter has to all the discussions about you know, the Planck length and things happening on the surface of black holes. But it's a, a bona fide uh, quantum system, which is a continuum. And it's regularized completely, not by any kind of lattice or anything. It's regularized by quantum fuzziness. And it's quite remarkable. And so we'll like, and, and uh, OK. So as I say, from my viewpoint, the most remarkable development in the past 40 years in, 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 in non perturbative physics was the discovery of the Laughlin state, which is essentially an accidental discovery. It was a discovery because Laughlin did a three-particle exact calculation for completely other reasons than 
to, he wanted to find out what happened to the Coulomb interaction at short distances after projection. But so as a consequence of doing this, which people like me at the time would never dreamt of doing, we, we were brought up to believe that Feynman diagrams was the summit of the theorist's art, and everything should be done by, by all this Wick theorem-based technology, which we thought would explain everything. The total shock was that it didn't, right? And in fact, the, uh, as I say, I think the Laughlin model is really, uh, it, since it was actually in some sense an accidental discovery, I mean, it wasn't kind of motivated by, by, by deep thought coming up with it. It was presented to us, and it's still taken some time to reveal all its secrets. And I still think there's many secrets for the Laughlin state to reveal because we have not yet come up with computational method. Uh, uh, Pen pencil and paper computational methods as opposed to understanding it. A lot of its properties can be verified or not by numerical calculation, which is philosophically unsatisfactory. We actually need to, but since we don't have Wick theorem-based techniques, we're stuck for the moment, but okay. Okay, so, so using the principle of Occam's razor, which was mentioned by Sir Michael, which is actually something which, which was was drummed into my head as in, uh, in learning about condensed matter, the thing is to remove every unnecessary ingredient as possible from your toy model. Cut it and cut it and cut it again. Uh, of course, if you've cut it too much and, and it's no good anymore, then you've learned something, but you want to find out exactly what needs to be kept in the model and what could be thrown away as kind of irrelevant, kind of uh, complicating junk. And the problem is we always get, one tends to get hung up on, 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 on irrelevant details, and so getting rid of as much as possible is the way to go. And for example, I would say the essential model for the fractional quantum Hall, Hall effect is a remarkably simple model. It's a quantum geometry. This is it. So we've got uh, a non-commutative uh, coordinate system. of par The particles have non-commutative coordinates. And they interact with a, with a, with a two-body potential, which is a potential which is a function of the non-commuting coordinates. That's it. So the, 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 the algebra does not give any space, any structure. The, the whole structure that's, that glues different bits of space together and gives you some fuzzy notion of locality is coming entirely from this single term here. Okay? So there's no aspect of, uh, you know, Bert mentioned Galilean invariance. There's no aspect of Galilean invariance. I actually regard Galilean invariance and stuff like this and cone theorem are totally irrelevant details which should be thrown out completely because they're not present. There's no notion of Newtonian particles in this. It's absolutely a, the cleanest possible uh, problem. So everything is contained in this function V. Okay, so as I say, so all dynamics is coming from the commutation relations. There is no, uh, there is no kinetic energy term in this. If it wasn't for the fact that the, the, the coordinates did, didn't commute, this, this would just be a static thing, right? So dynamics comes from non-commutativity of the, of the uh, coordinates. Uh, and geometry comes from the interaction. And what about the symmetries? This, this model has the only symmetries it has. It has a translational symmetry. And uh, because, in fact, the particles are, if we're dealing with the simplest case where the particles are identical particles, they form a quantum fluid with identical particles, it's got inversion symmetry. And it'll turn out that inversion symmetry is the key symmetry of the fractional quantum Hall state. Okay. Okay, so let's go through this. So, 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 so I'd say the people have learned a lot by staring at Laughlin wave function and all kinds of different fruitful and apparently contradictory ideas, composite bosons, composite fermions, flux attachment. Other thing come from every different people have looked at this looked at this enigmatic state and they've seen different aspects of it. And what I'm saying is one of the hidden aspects of it that I'm going to try and talk about a little bit is the, it has geometric properties. It, the, it has a geometry which is emergent in it, and we'll see where that is. Okay. So as I say, there's a Laughlin state. It's extremely elegant. It looks like something out of one's uh, complex analysis class. Uh, as I say, it's an elegant wave function. It describes a topologically ordered fluid with fractional charge and fractional statistics excitations. Uh, they're 
there are generalizations of this which have even more beautiful non-abelian type of structures in it. This is the simplest of the kind, but this is the kind of the, the thing, the inspiration for all the generalizations. And this turns out to be, uh, it's got various properties. It's actually got a, a relation to, it, it's mathematically got a relation to uh, conformal blocks and conformal field theories. Well, and it's, uh, uh, it's got a, an, ex an exact ground state of a modified model which keeps only the short range part of the interaction. And in fact, there's a great uh, logical uh, similarity between the Laughlin state, the special features that allow the Laughlin state to be the exact ground state of a, of a particular toy model, and this AKLT state that became a very simple model for the spin chains. You can actually argue the Laughlin state and the AKLT state have the same underlying structure. And the validity of the Laughlin state was quickly defined by numerical diagonalization. Initially, Laughlin came up with this thing. He said, I think this is a great variational state. So of course, other people thought, well, OK, he's got a good variational state. Maybe I can get a better one. <laughs> and there was a period with a few spurious evaluations of incorrect evaluations of other variational energies. But basically, the Laughlin state is good, not because it's a variational state, because it's got this, uh, it actually has an adiabatic connection by by the toy model Hamiltonian to the real system, and the numerical numbers uh, did that. So one issue is why does the Laughlin state work, right? Again, it was something that was denied to us because the answer was found without knowing why it worked. The answer was found and it worked. <laughs> and that answer question is still not fully uh, answered. And in fact, for the AKLT model, we've got various exact results for gaps and things. We have none of that yet, yet for the Laughlin state because it's become so intractable a mathematical problem. But obviously, it's got such deep structure, it must be tractable in the final analysis. OK, so what are the widespread misconceptions about the Laughlin state? It's often said to be described particles in the lowest lambda level. That's absolutely incorrect. No lambda level is specified in this problem. All the details of lambda level, as Bert pointed out, are hidden in detailed form of the interaction potential of the, of the non-commutative coordinates in, in the problem. The second statement, which Laughlin, of course, said was it's a Schrodinger wave function. It's usually called the Laughlin wave function. I use the term Laughlin state because it's it, on a real level, it should not be regarded as a wave function because it's a description of a state of a non-commutative geometry, and non-commutative geometries do not have Schrodinger representations. They have Heisenberg representation, but there's the locality which Schrodinger requires is gone. The other thing was it's, people think, what's its geometry? Its geometry is actually hidden. Initially, people thought the geometry has to be the shape of the Lando orbit, and that's the way it was as Laughlin formulated it. And it turns out not to be the case. And the other thing is it has no continuously variable, tunable uh, variational parameter. That's also incorrect. It turns out the variational parameter is hidden in the definition of the complex structure Z, which of course implies a metric. And the Laughlin state is actually a function of a metric, which is part of its relation to conformal field theory. There's a Euclidean conformal field theory hide hiding under, under this, not a Lorentz one. OK. So as I say, in a 2D Lando le level, we apparently start from the Schrodinger picture, but we had, we've ended up with a quantum geometry. Uh, so how do we actually translate Laughlin from the Schrodinger to uh, f way it was, it was initially proposed to the correct uh, Heisenberg formulation? Mm -hmm. So actually, if I go back to where Lando level structures come from, they come from a flat band structure, which is interesting because we actually believe these kind of states occur on lattices with flat band structures too, and that's still a big open question. But uh, the, the Landau level problem is as follows. We have a, some function, we have a kinetic energy, uh, particles, uh, a single particle term where particles have a kinetic energy where, where the momentum is P minus Ea, non, and it has an interaction term, some kind of bare Coulomb interaction. And that's our top level model. And of course, where does the quantum geometry come from this in, the, in this thing? It's because there are actually two independent Heisenberg algebras, if I have x and px and y and py. And they rearrange themselves when the magnetic field is present. So we have the, the, the uh, dynamical momentum has non-commuting components. And the conjugate variable that commutes with them is the center, the guiding center of the lambda orbits. 
And of course, the, we can now rewrite the dynamical momentum as a lambda orbit radius vector. So we actually have two, two non-commuting sets of coordinates with opposite handedness. And of course, the, the classical localizable coordinate of the electron is the sum of these two. But once one of them gets quenched out of the problem by quenching into a given Lando level, we lose the R bar and we get left with the, um, uh, just the guiding centers. And I will note that one of the things that, the, that one can interpret as going on, the flux attachment transition that happens to cause uh, incompressibility in quantum hole states, is related to the, we note that the, the, the Lando guiding center has a, all coordinates have an origin instability. You can measure them with respect to an arbitrary uh, origin. Of course, that's really the difference between a solid and a liquid. In a liquid, the particles have no natural origin. In a solid, the particles have a natural origin, which is the unit cell in which they're localized. And, uh, and there's an additional gauge aspect to this uh, um, origin, origin ambiguity of the guiding centers, because the guiding centers are both R, they have the origin instability of R, and they have the gauge instability of P. So they actually have a, a gauge transformation. And that, I believe, is, OK, we'll come back to that. OK, so we uh, project the, so the, or, the origin of this effective model is, from, is to project everything into, the, into a given energy level of, of E of P. And then uh, we get left with only the, the guiding centers. And then we have this non-commutative geometry. So the final for form of the problem has a, a very, this potential V of R is, is a very smooth potential. In fact, it turns out to be an analytic, it turns to be an entire function in the extension from R2 to, to C2, because it's a Fourier transform of a, of a rapidly converging, of a, of a rapidly uh, uh, converging function, okay, rapidly decaying function. And uh, okay, so there was our thing. And of course, the nature of the physics of the thing, which is because it has the flux attachment, it's kind of like an upside down potential. And if I solve the two particle problem, I can solve the, the rel two relative coordinates. They have similar, similar commutation relations to a single particle coordinate, except the effective charge got, got uh, halved, I guess, or doubled or something. So I can easily solve the two body problem. And you find, of course, that there's a set of energy levels in this upside down potential, and the ones which are the highest ones are the ones that are closest to the, the maximum of the potential. Here I'm assuming the potential is, is in some sense, monotonic. Okay. And uh, the physics of flux attachment is when you have a large gap between the highest state and the next and lowest down states. And, uh, this favors a kind of flux attachment, we'll see what that is, a kind of correlation hole forming to prevent any other particle getting, getting into this top level state of the particle. And that's the secret of the Laughlin state. And uh, as I say, if I think about geometry, if I do have a potential of this form and it's not that it's, that it's got a maximum and not a saddle point at the top, then the expansion around that point actually derive, this, um, gives you a natural metric it gives you the natural way space is connected uh, from in different directions. Right? So the metric comes out. So in fact, the, the interaction itself, of when it's of this form, will, will, will favor uh, quantum Hall states and have a, a natural emergent metric will, will come into the problem. OK, so in fact, the real problem has dirt in it. And so the, the way the thing works is we actually need why these systems are, are remarkable is because we have an inversion of the usual relation between one body and two body uh, interaction terms in the Hamiltonian. The dominant term in the problem will be this translationally invariant two body interaction, um, which itself has an energy scale which is probably much smaller than the energy gaps between different Lando levels, which makes when this, so this becomes a projection becomes a good thing. And it has an energy scale which is large compared to the underlying background one body case, in which case the one body stuff is a small perturbation on the two body system. And, and the two body terms cause these remarkable uh, quantum hole states to, to become the ground state of the system if I have a sufficiently uh, strong short range repulsion in the problem. Okay. Uh, okay, so as I say, 
the two-body potential is actually smooth because, but in fact, it's automatic. The fact you have this E of P, you have the, the, the one-body stuff of the momentum, which gave you the Lando levels, the energy function for the momentum has to be growing in all directions as I go to infinity, and that guarantees that the form factor of the Lando orbit is basically Gaussian and falls off sufficiently, sufficiently rapidly to guarantee that the, the, the V of R is actually has this strong, uh, strong smoothness properties that it's, that it's entire. Okay. okay, so what can this do? So here's our problem. And uh, without, obviously, until I've told you some more details about the interaction, it could do lots of different things. In fact, we know, three, we know at least three types of things that, that this, this kind of Hamiltonian can do. One will be that it, we can have these incompressible gapped translation invariant inversion symmetric and topologically ordered fractional quantum Hall states. Another thing it can do is if the long-range Coulomb interaction, this thing can have a long-range tail to it, dominates over the short-range repulsion, it doesn't cause flux attachment. Instead, the system will phase separate into regions of essentially filled Landau level and empty Landau level with walls between the two, and you get various stripe or bubble phases with broken translational symmetry. Or the third, perhaps more enigmatic ones, even as what Bert Halperin was talking about, is this composite Fermi liquid state, a gapless state, which is not incompressible and, uh, and has a neutral Fermi on surface. But possibly there's even more kinds of states we have. So we need to explore exactly what can happen for different choices of different kinds of interactions for this sort of quantum geometry problem. OK, so the point, one point is that the quantum geometry uh, doesn't support a Schrodinger representation. That's basically coming down to this property, the, the truce between uh, Heisenberg and Schrodinger in the 30s. Uh, basically, they, they kind of settled that they, they were describing the same thing, but they, the way you can translate from Heisenberg to Schrodinger requires you to have an orthonormal local basis. And you can put it on a lattice, or, but you can't, on this problem, you don't have an orthonormal local basis. Uh, and so that's why Schrodinger fails, but Heisenberg remains. OK. Right. So I can say, when is a wave function not a wave function? Essentially, when it describes a quantum geometry, because this fuzziness really is incompatible with wave function descriptions. OK. Uh, so here we have. Uh, this is the Laughlin state, and I'll quickly go through how the Laughlin state is, is actually formulated in the Heisenberg language. So again, we, we have this z, but let's, let's just let me skip through. So if I actually go to the, uh, the standard uh, harmonic oscillator Landau levels, now Landau levels do not have to be harmonic, okay? but uh, the simplest ones are harmonic. We have these raising and lowering operators, and we can write the guiding center, we can form the, if, if the lambda level raising operator is px plus i py, we could use rx plus i y, which is what people would, why would you do anything else? People didn't even think there was anything else to be done. You put that in. But of course, in the Heisenberg form of the Laughlin state is basically uh, a, 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 a holomorphic representation of the Heisenberg algebra, right? You've got, you, you make some choice of the A, you've got a vacuum, and you act on it with now not just simple A daggers, but this polynomial of A daggers. And of course, look that way, you can see this structure has no particular reference to any particular Lando level. There was some original historical baggage from the fact of harmonic oscillator Lando levels that made you think that the form of A should be Rx plus Ry. But actually, of course, it isn't. It's actually defined arbitrarily by a metric. It's an arbitrary. It's your choice to choose a representation of the Heisenberg algebra. To do that, you have to specify a metric, your particular choice. The Laughlin state is a state that looks good in a particular metric. <laughs> and uh, it tells you that the, 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 Laughlin, the metric actually should be chosen to sh to, uh, according to the shape of the interaction potential. If I now uh, give you this interaction, then now we realize the Laughlin state is not one state, but a family of states parameterized by a metric. And if there's no actual rotational symmetry in the problem, then you actually have to say, how do I choose it? I choose it to, I choose the metric to, uh, to, to minimize the correlation energy to, and uh, that's to uh, determined by the shape of the uh, interaction potential. So Laughlin states are actually a, a family of states parameterized by a metric. 
And uh, okay, now they're quite different. One might think that the Laughlin state with m equals two, three, four fermions or bosons is 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 contained in the sequence which contains m equals 1, which is the, the Slater determinant state of a completely filled lambda level. Absolutely not. The slate, if, I do a me, if I do a metric change on the A daggers for the filled lambda level, all I'm doing is causing a, uh, is, is changing uh, the basis of a Slater determinant, which doesn't change the state, at least if I compactify it. So it turns out the, 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 the Laughlin state, different Laughlin states are parameterized by their correlation hole, which is going to be the flux attachment shape that, uh, that, that builds these uh, composite particles, while there's no correlation of any kind and no correlation hole in the field lambda level, which is invariant under metric changes. Okay, so as well as being a variational trial wave function, the Laughlin state is actually the true ground state of a, of a certain short range interaction potential, as I mentioned, okay? And, uh, okay, so again, this is probably a repetition of what I said before, and I'll give you the, the, um, uh, the potential. So the particular potential which the Laughlin state's the exact eigenstate of is essentially the, uh, the, the Gaussian chosen to match the um, magnetic flux here, and it's actually, the more general state is Laguerre polynomials. If I just choose the first two, I can have A plus BR squared. And this toy model potential has exactly two non-zero eigenstates, the top one being a symmetric state and the second one being an anti-symmetric state. And all the other energy levels that are zero, so it's got a nice kernel. And that, if anyone knows about the AKLT state, that's actually also essentially the, the kind of structures we have in the AKLT model, uh, the one with the bi what the biquadratic uh, exchange term does for you. So we have this, so this, this, if I manage to, suppose I take bosons, I take the new equals a half state, if I, if I have this factor ai minus aj squared, it'll mean that no pair of particles ever gets into this upper symmet top symmetric level, and therefore any such state is an exact zero energy uh, eigenstate of this, of this Hamiltonian, which is actually a sum of projection operators and has a kernel, a non-trivial kernel. Okay, and it's a similar thing for the fermionic case for one third. Again, you avoid, uh, you, you have to have, no, there's no m equals one pairs, which would cost you energy, and so the Laughlin state is, manages to be the exact ground state of the thing. So the, as I say, the key idea of what's going on here is flux attachment. And in some sense, flux attachment is a gauge condensation that removes this gauge ambiguity of the, of the guiding centers. So it gives every particle, once flux is attached, attachment has occurred, has got a natural origin, which is the center of, flux of its flux attachment. So it's a natural origin with respect to all the other particles. And this means that the, the displacement operator becomes physical. <laughs> There was no meaning to the displacement operator if there's no natural origin for you to displace against. But once you've got a natural origin to displace against, the displacement operator becomes the electric dipole moment of the composite object. And so the, the um, and in many ways, that's like the people, there's a kind of hand-waving talk, I guess it was uh, maybe Phil Anderson was saying that gauge invariance was, ab was, pr was, was maybe <laughs> sufficiently well respected or something. People in the London equations, of course, the vector potential is sort of said to become observable once the, the broken gauge symmetry has happened. In this um, certain way, when the flux attachment makes this, uh, makes the displacement of the particles become observable because they get a natural origin for displacement against. Okay. So there's a kind of very kind of uh, strong analogy between the formation of these incompressible liquids and a quantum solid. So if you think about what a quantum solid is, uh, uh, if I think a simple quantum solid like uh, helium-4 helium or something, the unit cell essentially a correlation hole surrounding the particle. So I pull a particle out of the quantum solid, there's a nice correlation hole left behind and a nice attractive potential non with no singularity at the center which will attract the thing. So the repulsion for the other particles will cause a nice, make a, a nice attractive potential well. And the whole question of whether the solid is stable or not is whether that potential well is strong enough to bind, whether the vacancy surrounding, a, the vacancy into which a particle fits is, is strong, is, uh, 
has a deep enough potential to bind the particle itself. And of course, a solid will melt if this binding energy of the correlation hole around it is not strong enough to contain its zero point motion, which of course happens at low pressure helium. Well, this is somehow a, a, an analogous thing for what's going on in the, in the fractional quantum hull liquids. There's a strong analogy between the composite boson object, which is what they, uh, um, what, uh, what condenses, and the unit cell of a solid. The main difference is that in a solid, two unit cells stay next door to each other for all time unless a dislocation happens to sweep through them, while there is no such uh, um, uh, adjacency property of the, of the elementary objects of the liquid. But they still are little objects which carry a definite uh, quantized charge, like a unit cell has a definite content to it, and uh, um, they have some kind of... Uh, uh, they're the basic element. So a regular fluid doesn't really have such a, a basic element. Well, here there's a kind of basic non-trivial element, elemental unit of these, of these quantum hole fluids. So, of course, what is the, the Chern-Simons fields here? In this particular case, the physics of the, of the quantum hole state is essentially that this flux attachment means that... Uh, as the particle moves, carrying its, its, its uh, vortex-like uh, uh, um, correlation hole around it, the Berry phase generated by all the other particles getting out of the way of the, of the, um, uh, of the correlation hole of the, of the flux uh, exactly when it's right, exactly cancels the Bohm-Aharonov phases for the motion of the charge. And this object is able to propagate in straight lines like a neutral particle, the composite object. And in addition, it has to satisfy the condition that to both condense, that it can form a condensate, which means that under in interchange, any these two composite objects have to behave as bosons. And this was what was, I guess, Gervin and MacDonald kind of came up with some more obscure version of that, at least as the original kind of composite boson picture of the fractional quantum hall effect. And in fact, so one issue of this is, so if the particles are boson, they will condense into a zero momentum state, which is a zero electric dipole moment state, because there's a fundamental relation between now elect electric dipole moment and um, momentum. Uh, I think it was probably uh, here, some P is D cross B. And uh, right, so now the difference, of course, is it's not a, it's not a standard Bose condensation. <laughs> Uh, it's basically got this Higgs, uh, uh, Broad Engels Higgs, or whatever you can maybe call it that. The, 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 the fact is a gauge condensation means that the, what would, be the, would have been the Goldstone mode of a, of a global broken gauge symmetry or broken U1 symmetry, as in, a, as in an XY model, has, has gapped out the, the Chern-Zyman field is gapped out by this. Okay. So, um, okay. Right. So one of the so the fact they're gapped uh, means that they have the this fundamental quantum incompressibility property, which makes quantum incompressible fluids completely different from from classical Euler incompressible fluids. They don't transmit force. There's no sound wave, so forces are not transmitted through the bulk of these fluids. Forces can only be transmitted around the edge where they're gapless momentum carrying modes, which are described by the uh, with, a, with a dynamics described by the Virasoro algebra around the edge of the system, but there's no, there's no, uh, there's no pressure in these things. There's no, there's no transmission of pressure through the bulk, so I can't use this as a diamond anvil to to squeeze some little bubble in the middle of the fluid. Okay. And in fact, if one actually looks at these things with numerical calculations, which, as I say, has actually been the only kind of source of of, of true knowledge that you can you can trust about these things. Uh, these are kind of exact eigenstate calculations in various, probably on the torus of the geometries of uh, the models for which the Laughlin state's exact, and this is a model for one of the first of the non-abelian ones is exact, the Maurit case. Here you see you have the, the zero momentum, uh, zero dipole moment state sep top separated from everyone else, which is a topological uh, on the torus, it's got a topological degeneracy. It's described by the usual topological field theories. 
Um, the collective mode here is actually a, a bound state moving together of a quasi-particle and a quasi-hole, which are fr a billion objects which are fractionally charged for the um, thing. But I actually want to point, point out what's actually happening at long wavelengths. If you look through this carefully, you can see this mode is actually creeping up through the continuum of two of these uh, modes. So this is actually the lowest energy um, dipole are carrying excitation. But in fact, this thing creeps up, and there's a good reason to call what this ends up at zero momentum, which is buried in the condition as a kind of analog of the graviton. Because this is a, it's not a, I mean, it, it's, or, or there's an emergent metric. It's a spatial metric, not a space-time metric. So I'm going to have to wave one's hands around a bit more. But it certainly, it becomes a, a kind of meaningful to talk about this long wavelength mode as the graviton. It's the fluctuations of shape of the, of the, of the um, uh, of the flux attachment. This is a case for the more read case where you have non-abelian uh, quasi-particles which when you bring a pair together can either fuse in a fermionic or a bosonic channel and they, uh, they start the energies when they get close together you can tell which channel you're in. This is the fermionic channel, the bosonic one. If I could fool around with this model and make this go soft I would actually get the, uh, the Fermi liquid at one half. This is a one half state. So this is actually the Fafian that, uh, that Bert was mentioning. And so this would be the, the quote superconducting case of the Fafian or this something like that. Okay, so um, what do we see in the Lofen state? Uh, we have an anatomy of the state. How much time do I have actually? Out. Okay, yeah, so I, that's, that's what I thought. Yeah, so I should be out. <laughs> Right. Okay, so, uh, well, there's a, as I say, there's, there's a whole lot of kind of uh, beautiful stuff in these, in these systems. Um, let me just quickly uh, go through some of that. So, of course, one issue has been, always been, you know, what's the connection with conformal field theory? On one hand, there, of course, there's a conformal, it, it, the, edge, the edge modes of these theories uh, have the momentum algebra at the edge is the Borosaur algebra, and um, which is, it's chiral only, so it's actually the algebra of the different morphisms or reparameterization of the edge. Um, but in the bulk, the wave functions are related to a Euclidean rather than a uh, Minkowskian conformal field theory. And that's always, uh, these are toy model wave functions. And that seems to be a, a very special property of the, um, the Laughlin state as opposed to the generic states. But, Conformal field theory contains a beautifully straight, straightforward representation of the braid group within it. So, the, 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 of course, the braiding properties are generic and the conformal properties are, uh, are special to the toy models, which we talked about. Uh, okay, so, so what, is the, what is the metric? I'll just mention one thing. So, as I change the value of the, the Laughlin state, metric parameter, the shape of the correlation hold around the particles changes. And uh, an interesting uh, feature about this is, and of course the physics of incompressibility is something like this correlation hole belongs only to the particle sitting in it and there's a kind of energy gap, kind of like in a Hubbard model where it's an exclusion zone where it costs you energy to stick another particle in there. So this is very similar to conceptually to the incompressibility in Hubbard models except there's no lattice background uh, to be to, for the interactions to keep free of other particles, but it's a self-organized kind of uh, structure. Uh, let me quickly mention one thing here. So the other gauge fields, actually it turns out to be two gauge field structures, at least in this thing. One is the, uh, the Chern-Simons gauge field associated with the, the vortex, but there's a second gauge field, the spin connection associated with the shape of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the shape of the flux attachment. And by looking at these things, there's actually a natural spin in these, part in these composite particles, which can be associated with how the charges are arranged within these droplets. So again, that's a, a kind of analog of solids in the sense you can have different solids by different arrangements of the particles within the unit cell. Here we actually can have different kinds of quantum Hall states by, by different r arrangements of the charges within their flux attachment droplets. But however they're arranged, you can calculate a net, there's a, a natural spin in the problem, which turns out from calculating what the, if I treat this as uh, a metric and use that to measure a, uh, a kind of angular momentum, 
then I can calculate how much the angular momentum of the system differs from it would if I uniformly occupied all the orb if I just made a uniform thing with no structure, which would put, in this case it would put a one third in each of whatever. It's just a c convention. The most quantum of the Laughlin states is actually the spinner half state, which is the um, the Laughlin boson case. A field lambda level has spin zero. So if you want to include the field lambda level state as part of the sequence, it's kind of like the most ridiculous of the states. It's like talking about if I have gaps in integer spin spin chains, the spin zero chain is the one with the largest gap because there's no states above the ground state whatsoever, right? But uh, the, most, the most kind of non-trivially quantum of these things is the, 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 the Laughlin boson state. But if I go up in this sequence, you see this is a, there's a sequence as a two-fifth state. Uh, in the lowest lambda level, the, the, the natural sequence is that, and actually you can see there was an alternative description of these things, which is like, um, which is due to Jane, which was called composite fermions, where you have some kind of f electrons that fill fictitious lambda levels. In some sense, the states inside these droplets, which get filled in the lowest lambda level uh, sequence in the Pauli principle way, are the, these kind of fictitious lambda levels. The one thing you see is the spin of the state gets bigger and bigger as I go up the sequence. And in fact, the, the, the spin is odd under a particle hole transformation. <laughs> and in the sequence of the, the standard quantum hole sequence in the lowest lambda level, a third, two fifth, three seventh, terminating at a half, the spin is actually diverging. It's going to plus infinity on one side and minus infinity of the other side. And uh, a, a crucial result of, of, of um, Gerwin McDonald and Plasman essentially has a relation that somehow the, the gap in the system has a relation to being uh, in, inversely proportional to the spin. The gap is a quantum effect and the, the thing is more semi-classical the larger the spin. So uh, there seems to be, from this viewpoint, a problem with a particle hole symmetric quantum hole state. So actually what Bert was uh, discussing, my, I have a speculation which may be completely off the wall, but there may well be uh, it's not, it, it's not improbable uh, that there's a, a Mattis -Schultz, Liebschultz Mattis like uh, principle that says I cannot have a particle hole symmetric quantum hole state. I either have a broken, broken particle hole symmetry or a gapless system, which would fit in with the thing. Numerics has absolutely shown no indication whatsoever of the, of the T Fafian state, which was dreamed up on the basis of. Um, uh, of, of, of basic character tables. So there was there's no evidence of any kind. It was just be, it made a, it was dreamed up as a kind of more elegant uh, table, but anyway. So let me just move, move forward to the end. Uh, we can get these nice pictures. So by actually looking at geometrical pictures, one can kind of uh, think of, um, get some notion about energies, which has been a missing problem, a missing, in, a missing issue in all these uh, um, things. How do we understand the energetics of quantum hole states? Up till now, we've really relied completely on numerical investigations and no real handle on how to do, how to understand which state is better and which state is not without doing numerics. But in some sense, uh, for example, it turns out that the two-fifth droplet is a quasi-particle of the one-third state. So I add a, so we can actually reinterpret a lot of the um, composite fermion language in terms of the hopping of composite. Fermion charge transport occurring between comp composite fermions, which is a particle with two fluxes hopping around between various elementary objects of the fluids. Let me just finish now. Uh, I think I don't have time for that. Yeah, so the wild thing is that the, the, it turns out that the spin, there's a, not just one gauge field around in here, the spin couples to the Gaussian curvature of the metric. And that's, of course, the general nature of spins coupled to curvatures. So it turns out that in the, in the full structure, the electron density is not just tied to the magnetic field density. It's actually tied to a combination of the magnetic field density and the Gaussian curvature of its own metric. There was a historical an analogy for this before. There was something called qu ferromagnetic quantum Hall states, where you had a additional gauge field coming from a coupling of the Pauli spin of electrons, which was spin polarized, to the Berry curvature of the spin direction field of the ferromagnet. And you were able to move charge around 
And here you can do the same thing too, that the, the geometric aspect of it, where the spin couples you to the Gaussian curvature, allows the system to adapt. So the interaction energy will favor um, a particular shape of the, of the flux attachment. But the Hamiltonian in the full system is a combination of the one-body potential energy and the two-body interaction energy. So even if the potential energy is essentially flat in the bulk, when I get to the edge, it has to go up to contain the system. And in fact, by allowing the system would like to squeeze your system inwards, if it couldn't react at all, nothing would happen. But in fact, by paying an energy cost of deforming the metric away from the the favored one that lowers the energy, I can, I can build in a get, a, I can get some spatial variation of metric and Gaussian curvature to, to allow the system to relax a little bit at the boundary. And you get some interesting geometrical things that near a defect from near a quasi hole, you'd expect again to, to shift the Coulomb energies, lower the Coulomb energy by deforming the, the, the metric in the neighborhood of the thing. So there's a kind of, the G, so, the richness, when, so if one didn't realize that the Lofton state had an internal metric uh, and just thought it was a rigid thing, you would miss out on the fact it's actually got some more life to it. There's an emergent geometry, and that emergent geometry has some aspects of, of quantum geometry in the thing. So uh, as I say, I think, I'll, I think this is a very interesting problem, and uh, you know, if so people from... <laughs> And quantum geometry, quantum, quantum gravity, or whatever, have some time on this time on their hands. Uh, you know, things go through phases when the problem is hot or not, right? There's there's a lot of very interesting things here that one could get some uh, good Im good good feedback from them for. Thank you. I guess in the interest of keeping time, we will just stick to one question. This is a very naive question. I was, wonder, I was wondering if there's anything to be gained if we change the non-commutative plane by a compact surface like a torus and replace the potential by a periodic potential or something like that. Yeah, the, the calculations are actually all done okay, on the torus or the sphere. Oh, I see. But, uh, yeah, the, 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 in fact, uh, the torus is very useful. One can get better understanding of things like the Fermi liquid state that Bert was talking about, because when you put things on a torus, the kind of allowed values of momentum, and which means allowed values of dipole moment get quantized, and I can actually fill a set of points rather than the, yeah. It, the different geometries have turned out to be extremely useful for the thing ones. Torus, sphere, cylinder, yeah, there's a lot of uh, different uh, kind of things. Let me see if I got the, yeah. Anyway, whatever, I thought I had some. Anyway, I've also made this comment somewhere that, uh, that, that it's not impossible that uh, the T Fafian has not shown up in any numerics because it doesn't exist. But that's just a, I've got no, just a gut feeling on that and nothing else. Yeah. Okay, let's thank all the speakers once again. And we will